Mr. President, uh, this morning on Twitter, you were referring to the testimony of James Comey vindicating you. But I wondered if you could tell us in person, sir, why you feel that his testimony vindicated you when it's really boils down to his word against your word. Investing, and, and you activism, us, sir, rebuilding you America together. This is the well, Jeff Santos that, Show. Maybe sometime in the very near future. But uh, in the meantime, no collusion, no obstruction. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. He's a leaker. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I don't recall it. I know I was fired because of something about the way I was conducting the Russia investigation. Was in some way putting pressure on him, in some way irritating him. And he decided it is uh, the words, that might lie about the mixing, meeting, and the music so of our next guest, stunned. Mark like Taylor Canfield, known as MTC. And, of course, he is a regular here every other Sunday at 2.30 Eastern Time, 11.30 Pacific. He's also a great journalist. Find him on Capitol Hill Times in Seattle and, of course, the Daily Coast. He is Mark Taylor Canfield, and he joins us now from the Pacific Northwest, the city of Seattle, which in a couple of years will have a hockey team. Happy Sunday, Mark. How are you? Hey, Jeff. Always good to talk to you, and thanks, Keith, for playing my track there, Total Rock of Recall, and you can find that at my YouTube channel at YouTube, the MTC Report also. And also I wanted to let folks know I just um, had an article published at BuzzFlash about the, the big showdown between our Socialist City Council member here in Seattle and Jeff Bezos for taxing uh, corporations to provide money for affordable housing. So... I've uh, been a busy guy. We also have all sorts of music festivals coming up. And I'm actually performing this afternoon outdoors, so I'm looking out the window hoping that the weather holds. <laughs> hoping it doesn't Well, we hope so, it. man. Hey, when is that yeah. uh, Bumbershoot Festival? I went about 20 years ago, and uh, Jackson Brown played, and uh, the fabulous Thunderbirds. That's how, how long ago it was. But it was such a great sh- show outside in the, you know, in the – farmlands or whatever they they had over there one of the fairgrounds and uh, i know they've had some great shows uh, obviously since but that was an awesome show back then and um you know is that coming up in the next month or so is or is it august or when is that actually that's labor day weekend jeff so oh, okay we, we got a time for that but it's um it happens now at seattle center right down at where the space needles at and the key arena and all that and we just had a four-day festival called Folk Life, a Folk Life Festival, well, three days officially. Um, and I participated in that as well. But that's one of the best festivals in Seattle because it's all free, believe it or not. Now, yep. I did write an article last year in the Capitol Hill Times questioning whether it was going to continue to be free because they kept floating these rumors that it might be the last free concert last year. But the executive director for Folk Life had to write his own editorial in response to mine. <laughs> and I think I may have saved it, Jeff, because it's still cool. free this year. Awesome. <laughs> so I lit a little fire. Our under champion that MTC. Way to go, yeah. Mark. You. Yeah, thank God, because Folk Life is one of the best uh, festivals in Seattle. And it has acts from all over the world, of course. So folk music from all over the world. Uh, some of my favorites, the West African drumming. And uh, the beautiful music coming from Jamaica, of course, the reggae is always really, really popular. So everything qualifies as folk music these days, Jeff, even punk rock. So believe it or not. <laughs> well, that's, that's a little bit of a stretch, but all right, I, I hear you. We, we can include a lot of people into that uh, world. Um, you know, and, and speaking of that, next uh, Sunday, for all you folks who are uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary fans, um, a candidate, uh, Bob Massey, uh, is, is having a, a benefit for him, fundraiser. Um, and uh, Mr. Stuckey of Peter, Paul, and Mary um, are, uh, is performing with some other uh, guests as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's all folk all the time on, on uh, our political worlds, <laughs> uh, Mark. Uh, so that's great. Well, if, folks, um, if folks want a great tip on some great music clubs in Seattle, Go to the clubs that are actually run by the musicians where the booking agents and stuff are musicians because they do great stuff. And the Sea Monster Lounge is one of the best. Um, I performed there last week. There's a one in Columbia City called the Royal Room, which is getting rave reviews from all the musicians around town. 
Um, there's all sorts of, of really great places to play in Seattle where the musicians um, are pretty much organizing. There's another place called the Lo-Fi, which always has great local bands. So regardless of, you know, the, the high rents and, and other things that are making, making it difficult for up-and-coming artists in Seattle, there's still a lot of great music going on. The Highway 99 Blues Club. Um, Jeff, when you come to Seattle, that's where I'm going to take you. The Highway 99 Blues Club, which we were at last night for my friend's birthday party, is one of the best clubs around. It's authentic, uh, hardcore blues all night, every night. Musicians get paid well, which is great. They really take care of the musicians awesome. in the crowd. So it, Highway 99 Blues Club is probably one of the best. Highway 99. Fantastic. Folks, if you're in that uh, Pacific Northwest listening to us, check it out. Maybe catch Mark on stage. Uh, but it sounds like some great stuff. And, yes, when I get out there, we definitely need to go. I want to do the whole thing. If we can get out there for Labor Day weekend, maybe we can uh, figure out uh, in the bumper shoot, too. Um, but Mark, I want to get to Absolutely. I want to get to what you were talking about with with the uh, with the Amazon fight because I see now you know Donald Trump went after him because of the Washington Post stuff after Bezos, but it's great to see the Seattle City Councilor and it's great to see Bernie Sanders talking about Bezos. We had a conversation last night with some friends in the Bob Massey campaign uh, about you know the impact of uh, Amazon and uh, you know this is something that a lot of people are now you know, getting involved with. And it's unfortunate that the Republican, you know, right-wing loony candidate and Mr. Trump, our president, I should say, um, you know, is the one that is going after him, you know, for a lot of wrong reasons. But the fact is, is that uh, he's spot on on this. And I think, um, you know, the city councilor and, and Bernie and others are, are also, you know, looking at this, and this is a very bad thing. Uh, for the country. Give me a little more on this and what uh, your city council, whose name I can never pronounce, um, is uh, is saying. Uh, the council member's name is Shama uh, Sawant. And Sawant, that's she, right, Sawant. Yeah, she has a PhD in economics uh, from North Carolina University, and she went to the University of Mumbai as well. They don't know what the next step is. They're just in a quandary right now of how to deal with it. We're going to come back and talk more with uh, Mark Taylor Canfield, musician, activist, author, and, of course, a great journalist here on the Jeff Santos Show. We'll come right back, take your phone calls as well at 844-967-2789. You can email me, Jeff, at Revolution. Building America together, this is the Jeff Santos Show. 49 minutes past the hour. This goes out to you, Peter, in Plain City. And for all you progressives, and shout out to a good friend, Robin Bergman in Arlington, Massachusetts, part of the Bob Massey supporters group. This is done during the late 80s and Gary Hart sex scandal and all the other things that happen in that time period. I ask you to support this show and many other progressive and TV shows like Free Speech TV and others. And uh, it is critical that we uh, indeed have that and, and support uh, independent media groups, the people like Mark Taylor can feel right for, too. Mark, you have seen it uh, across this country for years now um, and, and the lack of good journalism. And there are some good journalists that work in corporate media. We know that in Seattle and other places here in Boston. Uh, but it is uh, unfortunately more and more sensationalism, you know, give us – uh, more Stormy Daniels, you know, give us, uh, you know, more and more dirty laundry. Uh, your thoughts, my friend? Well, in some ways, it's sort of the Rupert Murdoch style of journalism, which, you know, tabloid news journalism, which in the past, you know, when I was in the U.K., it was very ob obvious which uh, magazines, you know, or newspapers that he owned, you know, like The Sun or whatever, that would have the girly pictures on page three, you know, which ones were exploitative like that? Like you can see the National Enquirer in the United States is like that. But now exactly. it's difficult to know where the dividing line is between real news and gossip and scandal 24-7. And as we were talking off the air, our former city council member and one of the best progressives in the Northwest, as far as I'm concerned, um, Nick Licata, who's written some really great books about citizen activism, he came out with an editorial, I believe, for the Seattle Times um, this last week, saying that it's time for people to step back from 
the Trump tweets and people need to, he said, actually, he suggested a 12 step program for people who are addicted to Trump's tweets. And that's just one area, but yeah, it's been a, it's been a real problem. And meanwhile, there are real stories that are going on behind the scenes. In fact, a, a national story um, that King, my county, King County, is just joined in along with New York City, which in January filed its own lawsuit against the five largest oil companies. And then last summer, two California cities and one county initiated, initiated legal action against 37 fossil fuel producers. Um, and that's happening up here in Washington State where they're claiming that the oil company has been hiding information about climate change. And it looks, Jeff, like this is becoming a, a national movement now. And some of the legal experts are saying that based on some of the tobacco lawsuits in the past that, you know, King County might actually have a decent um, chance of winning some of these lawsuits, which the money that's won from the lawsuit would go towards mitigating climate change, you know, so it's a good cause. But those are the kind of stories that aren't getting covered because everybody yeah, is talking about Stormy Daniels. And, you know, for me, it kind of started during the debates between – Clinton and Trump when the political dialogue just got drugged through the mud, through the dirt, you know, I mean, it was really getting nasty. And it seems like those, those kinds of, you know, lowbrow themes are what everybody likes to concentrate on right now in the media. And it's really sad to me, you know, especially in a country where, you know, our reputation for journalism is slipping every year. And so being an American journalist, I'm really sad that the dialogue is just stuck in these cycles of what Trump said today and what is which official he's going to fire today and what sex scandal is going on. It's just it's sad, Jeff. It's a sad day for America. I really, you know, lately have been listening to the speeches of John F. Kennedy and Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And by the way, there was a speech, you know, that I tweeted about where Reagan was praising Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So don't tell me, conservatives, that FDR is what you're against. Um, but, you know, I wish for those days when, when the speeches were meant to inspire the country, to move beyond hatred and prejudice, and to get us into the 21st century, which is where we're supposed to be, by the way, Jeff. Yes. But, uh, sometimes yes. I wonder. <laughs> I wonder. We've gone backwards, <laughs> my friend. It's centuries prevails. Yes, exactly. Yeah. We've gone back seemingly a hundred years, and and that's and that's the tragic thing because there are there are some there's some great works just not getting the airtime uh, that they would, you know. And now we, you know, the famous Bruce Springsteen line: uh, "There are what fifty two channels and nothing on," and that was years ago when when uh, cable had about fifty channels or five hundred channels, whatever the number is that Bruce used. But the fact is, is that you know, because of the fact that. Corporate media, you know, usually owns, as Comcast does, MSNBC, you know, as, uh, you know, Time Warner for a long time before they sold now to AT&T would own CNN. And so they, you know, they push their product, Fox, et cetera, DirecTV, you go on and on. And this is what we have. And, of course, the newspapers die left and right. They close. Seattle's a one-paper town. You know, I mean, this is the the tragedy of it all, and um, I think Boston's probably soon to be as well. Um, you know, I I think well, that there is, is a, you know, it's a real sad time for for journalism and media as a whole. Ironic that the media, uh, some networks like CNN, were were complaining about the Trump election when they were the ones who gave him so much airtime while taking you know airtime away from folks like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth That's Warren right. and other progressive voices, and also. So they complain about getting, him getting elected, and then once he gets elected, it's like all Trump all the time, 24-7. So he was, you know, threatening to build his own news networks, network, right? Well, he doesn't need to because CNN and MSNBC and NBC and everyone else is giving him coverage 24-7 anyway. He, they don't, he doesn't need his own news network. They're covering him all the time. So I just think it's yeah, really and his ironic. Right, and his philosophy, and a lot of people like this, is that bad news is good news. You know, it's just news, and and he just—it's uh, not really news; it's just propaganda, you know, with another perspective. Um, and, you know, and that just feeds the feeds the monster. You know, he wants to he wants to basically bamboozle twenty four seven. Look at this shell. Meanwhile, my administration in Congress is moving the other shell, which is going to destroy your lives. You know, EPA, education, health care. That doesn't get covered because we're all focused on Stormy Daniels. And the Democrats, my God, if they can't figure this out or if they, they better, better have people who 
can figure it out and do something about it and say, look, you know, we hear your frustration that nothing got done during Obama's last few years, but we got better solutions. And here they are. And, and again, as I said many times, they're Bernie solutions. If you don't give Bernie the keys to the car, you better let him sit in the front seat and co-pilot. Because if you don't, you're not going to win. And that's the sad state of affairs. Even if you win a few places in liberal Massachusetts or liberal Washington State, California, it's still not going to be enough. Your final I thoughts, man. I still maintain that Bernie Sanders could have won the election. People were looking for a populist and an alternative independent voice. And he was the only candidate who would have addressed some of these issues that are. I'm Ann Cates. Brad Zog, owner of Zero Res Madison. Brad, why should people use. I would have for you, and I share your frustration about corporate media and people not getting good information, is, is that the best research on what persuades people, why people believe what they believe does not say that facts change people's minds. People select facts, it's called motivated reasoning, that support what they already want to believe. So there's something right. more fundamental we need to get at. And there is a third of the population or so that just considers right-wing Republicans and Donald Trump their side, and they're not reachable. No matter what argument you made, what facts, what you showed them, they would find some contorted way to, to, uh, to, to reach that point of view. That's what Fox and right-wing talk radio were about. They're all about giving facts to people, fake facts, to, uh, to justify what those folks want to already believe. But there's this middle group that literally is not is, is movable, persuadable, and then there's, there, there's our base that needs to be motivated and activated, and that's where it's, it's not still not so much about facts. It's about vision. It's about having an appealing vision of what kind of society we can create that people can buy into. And, if you can, and we have this huge opportunity because a lot more people are open to it in this election than usual because of just how god-awful uh, Trump rule has been. Uh, but we do have a problem where literally – we have a propagandocracy where, pe where people don't have enough access to information. The only thing to do that is to use new media, to use volunteering, phone bank, canvassing. Grassroots still works if you have a message. You have real people who are appealing messengers, people from their community, right? Not someone from outside communicating the message and having real conversations. And that's still more powerful than electronic media. It just uh, it, it's just harder to get the magnitude you need, right? Because electronic media hit so many people so quickly. But you, but quite frankly, a Trump tweet isn't going to convince anyone anymore that isn't already on his side, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. Um, John, if you want to make one more point, go ahead. I, I think face to face. I mean, I think I have kind of gotten through to this person, uh, you know, to a degree because I did say that you know we, we don't talk to one another. You know, uh, we we don't uh, connect, and I, I express that you know even uh, you know within the in the context of say like our revolution. I think uh, people are so interested in getting the program set up or whatever it is you know to organize that they forget that you have to, you know, a lot of us are new at this or, you know, you have to connect on a human level. And I, I've, uh, I think that's, that's kind of lacking in how, how you do that is, I mean, I hate to use this word because that's kind of false, but schmoozing, you know, going out for a drink, you know, uh, just discussing things informally in an informal situation like I did at a dog park, I think, in some ways, is much much more. Those doggies will help you. I tell you. Yeah, yeah, as <laughs> persuasive than uh, you know a formal group where you know they're they're uh, interested in 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 forming an organization, and then it has to do with efficiency and it has to do with how you're going to you know pull all this off. It 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 doesn't answer the kinds of things that people want to be able to connect with on a deep level, I guess, is right. what I'm Thank saying. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Um, okay, let me, <clears throat> let me just wrap this up. Do you think, uh, Robert, that we will see, you know, several, <clears throat> excuse me,